Good afternoon. I'm Doug Loud speaking for O&M Partners, and I want to welcome everyone to the Endeavor Silver Town Hall webinar. Just so you know, Endeavor Silver trades under the symbols EDR on the TSXV and EXK on the New York Stock Exchange. For those of you who are new to these broadcasts, seven years ago in 2014, O&M recognized there was a sea change occurring in non-deal investment marketing. Suddenly, information was way more available to a whole new generation of investors that weren't usually found in the key financial centers. Investors were receiving information at home that used to be geared and available only to professional investors. So O&M developed a digital approach to providing this information. After the presentation today by Brad Cook, there will be a question and answer uh, series. The questions in the Q&A are for everyone. This broadcast will answer questions you may not have even known to ask. I know that happens to me. Questions will, can easily be answered by going to the question portal of the GoToWebinar or by emailing us. Any questions that remain unanswered will follow up on in a timely manner after the call. For those of you who've dialed in with your phone, the only way you can hear the pre-recorded introductory presentation is on your computer speakers. So if that's not possible, you will be able to hear the main presentation after 12 to 15 minutes. So please stay tuned. Today, our introductory speaker will be Ronald Peter Sturfel um, of CMT Fund Management and Research Incrementium AG. Uh, Ronnie, as he's known, is the managing partner of Incrementium AG and responsible for research and portfolio management. He studied business and administration and finance in the United States and then Vienna University of Economics and Business Administration. In 2007, he joined the Erst Group where he published um, his first version of In Gold We Trust Group. Over the years, the In Gold We Trust Report has proceeded to become one of the benchmark publications on gold, money, and inflation. Since 2013, he's become a speaker at the Vienna Stock Exchange Academy and written two books, The Austrian School for Investors and Zero Interest Rate Trap. He's also an advisor to Tudor Gold, which is a significant explorer in British Columbia's Golden Triangle, as well as a member of the advisory board of Affinity Metals. Now here's Ronnie. Good afternoon from Europe, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure participating in this Silver Town Hall meeting. Many thanks to O&M and to Endeavor Silver for inviting me. My name is Ron Stöffele and I'm managing partner and fund manager at Incrementum and Liechtenstein. And I'm the author of the annual In Gold We Trust report. So let's get into the discussion. Well, first of all, uh, a brief introduction. Um, we're based in Europe, in Liechtenstein, a very small country in the center of Europe. And what we're doing is asset management, especially in the precious metals and commodity space. Many of you might know the annual In Gold We Trust report that we publish for um, 15 years now already, and which is the most widely followed publication on gold. And we reach roughly 2 million people with this publication and we're putting it out totally for free in German, in English, and as also in Mandarin. And it wouldn't be possible without the fantastic support of our premium partners, really the creme de la creme of the gold and silver sector. And of course, Endeavor Silver is also a proud premium partner. So thank you very much for that. Let's jump into the discussion. First of all, I think, ladies and gentlemen, we are seeing historic monetary and fiscal stimulus. And from our point of view, it will lead to a surge in price inflation. Now, Herbert Hoover said, blessed are the young for they shall inherit the national debt. And in the book, Lords of Finance, they say monetary policy does not work like a scalpel, but more like a sledgehammer. And we're seeing effects um, of both this monetary policy, but also of fiscal policy at work in financial markets. Now, as you can see on this slide, 
the big difference between the great financial crisis and the COVID crisis of 2020. From my point of view, now we are seeing basically unlimited quantitative easing all over the globe. But now we are also seeing very, very aggressive fiscal stimulus. And this cooperation, these very close ties between fiscal and monetary policy is something that has definitely changed. And the new head of the treasury, Janet Yellen, the former head of the Federal Reserve, I think we, we cannot overestimate the symbolic character, the symbolism of, uh, of this move by Joe Biden. It is telling us, well, it is not only fiscal policy that is supporting us, it is also monetary policy. And those two very, very close and powerful actors will act together now. Just to give you a view about the size of um, fiscal and monetary stimulus in 2020, it amounted to 33 trillion US dollars. Just in Western Europe, it was 6 billion US dollars of uh, fiscal stimulus, which is 30 times larger than the Marshall Plan back in the days measured in today's monies. So those, this, this size is truly enormous. And what you can see on this chart is the M2 growth rate, which is now at the moment significantly higher than in the highly inflationary 1970s. And there's also a big difference to be seen compared to 2008, 2009. Back then, M2 growth collapsed. Now, in the middle of the crisis, M2 is surging. So that's one big difference. The second thing that I would like to emphasize is, is that M2 growth rates and inflation are highly correlated. You can see that so far inflation rates are still pretty low, but this correlation is tight and M2 growth per capita has already risen significantly. And as I've said, it's truly an enormous, one could say off the charts, um, size of monetary stimulus. If we compare it again with 2008, 2009, it's significantly large. It's also much larger than, larger than anything that we have seen in the 1970s. Now with the new president, Joe Biden, I think this is not gonna end. A small debt produces a debtor, a large one, an enemy. And Joe Biden already said, well, this 900 billion stimulus is only a down payment. And the now 3.3 trillion of total stimulus spending is just the beginning. So we are, or the US is heading into a program of permanent stimulus. And the Wall Street Journal, they asked the question, well, uh, it's not a question of if government is going to run out of other people's money, but when. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know that at the moment, we don't see any big inflationary moves yet. And one of the main reasons for that is velocity. So it's basically telling us because of the COVID crisis, we are now seeing that nobody is making any big plans. We don't see any big investments by corporations. People are quite hesitant to make big investments, to, to um, make traveling plans, etc. But as soon as this whole uncertainty is coming out of the market, velocity will pick up. And actually, velocity has already stabilized. Now, this enormous amount of liquidity that was created over the last couple of months will meet rising inflation. And this is the recipe for surging price inflation. Now, from my point of view, the vaccine will be the light at the end of the tunnel. It will improve this picture, this bleak picture, this loss of confidence will come back at some point over the next couple of months. And I think we're at the beginning stage of this process. Now, 
we just published a special report on inflation. It's 40 pages long. It's called The Boy Who Cried Wolf. And it's available totally for free on our web page. Now, how can we prepare against the surge in inflation? Abraham Lincoln said, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. In this special report, we analyze the best hedges against inflation. Obviously, gold is not the worst idea. As you can see on this chart, gold had a tremendous year in 2020. It was up 24% in US dollar terms. It was up 22% in Canadian dollar terms. It was up 18% um, in Japanese yen. And most importantly, gold is rising in every currency now. Gold has made new all-time highs in every currency last year. Or we can say the purchasing power of those currencies measured in gold has made an all-time low last year. What about silver? Silver performed extremely well in 2020. It was up almost 50% in US dollar terms. It was up 44% um, in Canadian dollar terms. Since the year 2006, on average, silver is up 11%. Now we know that silver is extremely volatile, but based on our report, and we published more than 350 pages about gold last year, and will publish probably um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, a report that is probably even longer this year on 27th of May. Based on our main thesis that gold is in a bull market, silver should outperform gold. Now, what you can see on this chart is the gold to silver ratio since 1960. Last year, this ratio, this exchange rate between gold and silver, it basically made an all-time high at 125. So with one ounce of gold, you could have bought 125 ounces of silver, which is truly off the charts. Now, normally uh, the median is at 58. And over the course of a bull market in gold, silver normally outperforms gold. So where can, how can, how high can silver rise? Well, you know, if we see a price of gold at roughly 2,300 this year, which is our, our base case, then normally the, the uh, gold silver ratio should fall to levels around 40 or 50. So that then we would co come up at silver prices at new all time highs at 55, at 60. So just to let you know, if gold continues to perform well, silver will perform tremendously well. Now, let's talk a bit about mining stocks and commodities. The party has just begun, or we could also say the party for the US dollar is over. From my point of view, the US dollar has started a secular bear market. Now at the mark at 90, in the, in the Dixie index, so the US dollar index, I think there will be some sort of a bounce, but sooner or later we will break below this massive support line. And what does it mean? Well, a bear market in the US dollar is normally a bull market for commodities. You can see this very, very tight correlation. And we can see that commodities really woke up to life last year. So from my point of view, commodities are a great investment going forward. Why? Because commodities are dirt cheap. Have a look at this chart. It's showing you the ratio of the GSCI commodity index versus the Dow Jones. You can see that relative to stocks, commodities are at the lowest level ever. We're even lower than in the 1970s. So commodities are tremendously overvalued. And I think that with this fiscal stimulus, with this green wave, we will see a renaissance of commodities. Miners are still very inexpensive relative to gold. Same goes for silver. 
a ratio of the BGMI, the Barron's Gold Mining Index, and gold is telling us that relative to gold, the miners are extremely inexpensive. And the miners really did their homework over the last couple of years. They strengthened their balance sheets. They got their cost structure under control. So now they are real cash flow machines. From my point of view, um, I've probably never in my career seen the balance sheets of the mining sector at a healthier level. And this bull market, this party has just begun. Now have a look at previous bull markets. You can see, well, it's, it's not the shortest bull market, but so far the performance is clearly in line and we haven't seen any parabolic explosion as we normally see at the end of every bull market. So it's, it, it means that actually I think the best days are still ahead of us. And this mania phase is about to come at some point. Now, where will we go? Chris Cole, one of my favorite asset managers, he said, we need to think outside the paradigm of the last 40 years if we wish to thrive over the next two decades. Well, gold and silver, of course, as well, are still extremely underowned in institutional portfolios. You can see that commodities at the moment are only 3% of the total portfolio, while gold compared to the total portfolio is at the moment 0.15%. And silver, I don't know, but it's even lower. But now we're seeing that institutional investors are joining the party again. What you can see here is gold held in ETFs as a percentage of US equities. And you can see that Goldman Sachs, for example, announced the acquisition of the Perth Mint physical gold ETF. So something is happening in the space. And that leads me already to my conclusion, ladies and gentlemen. After the COVID crisis comes the debt crisis. Rising price inflation is not a tail risk. Negative real rates are the new normal. The renaissance of gold in institutional portfolios has started. Mining stocks and commodities are still largely underowned. And gold, silver and miners are on the way to many new all-time highs. That's it. That was a really brief and quick wrap up of my thoughts, my convictions. I hope you enjoyed it. And now I wish you a fantastic evening with Endeavor Silva. Thank you very much for taking the time. Take care and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ronnie. That was really very interesting. Now we're going to hear about Endeavor Silver. And today our presenter will be Bradford Cook, known as Brad, the chief executive officer of the company. He's a professional geologist and entrepreneur with 40 years of experience in the mining industry. Brad has specialized in the formation, management, and financing of exploration and mining companies and the acquisition, exploration, development, and mining of mineral properties. Brad founded Endeavor Silver in 2003 for the purpose of acquiring high-grade silver gold projects in Mexico. Since that time, the company has acquired rebuilt and expanded four silver gold mines in Mexico and made a new discovery with the potential to become Endeavor's fifth mine. Uh, Brad received a Bachelor of Science Geology degree with honors from Queen's University and a Master of Science Geology degree from the University of British Columbia. He's a member of a number of associations such as the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of British Columbia, the Canadian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada, the Association of Mineral Exploration in British Columbia, and a fellow of the Geological Association of Canada. Now, here's Brad. Welcome to this presentation on Endeavor Silver, entitled Profitable Production, Compelling Growth. I will be making some forward-looking statements today, so you are duly cautioned. And uh, by way of introduction, uh, some of the highlights of the company, we are considered to be a mid-tier producer of gold and silver. We own and operate three high-grade underground silver gold mines in Mexico. There's really four catalysts that drive value for our shareholders, both short and long-term. Um, firstly, uh, we've been very successful in recent 
uh, quarters at reducing our operating costs and boosting our free cash flow. This was before the move in the price of the metals. Um, secondly, we're, I think, probably best known for our organic growth profile, uh, sector leading organic growth profile, with not one but two new discoveries awaiting development in Mexico. Uh, thirdly, we're very successful at, uh, at making new discoveries. In fact, every ore body that we've developed, every mine that we've put into production, uh, was as a result of discoveries by our exploration team. Uh, we did not buy other people's uh, resources and, and build mines around them. We basically bought fully built and permitted infrastructure and got the exploration drills turning again to find new virgin discoveries in historic districts. And last but not least, we do from time to time pull the trigger on opportunistic mergers and acquisitions to grow our asset base. Endeavor, because it only produces silver and gold and no base metals, uh, has the best leverage uh, of our share price to the silver price in the sector. So, headquartered in Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, core assets in Mexico, and exploration portfolio in Chile. Some recent highlights, uh, we had our strongest quarterly production in the, the fourth quarter of last year, uh, uh, over the last two years, with uh, 2.1 million ounces of silver equivalents produced uh, from uh, September 30th to year end. That was a 21% increase quarter on quarter. Uh, we did achieve our 2020 production guidance of 6.5 million ounces silver equivalents, and that's notwithstanding a, a two-month government-mandated suspension of our mines uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, most recently, we agreed to sell one of our now dormant assets, the El Kubu mine, which we closed over a year ago. Uh, we now have an agreement to sell it to a junior company, Vangold, for $15 million in cash and share payments, plus some additional payments down the road. We anticipate to close uh, that deal here in the first quarter. And in, if you look at our um, financial performance year on year, at the end of Q3, our cash costs were down 68% to three and a half bucks uh, per ounce of silver. All in sustaining costs were down 19% to 17 and a half bucks per ounce silver. Our Q3 operating cash flow jumped 400% to $10 million, and our Q3 uh, end of quarter uh, cash position grew to $45 million, working cap $54 million. Um, I can tell you that uh, we expect to announce in uh, late February our year-end financials and cash and working capital are once again sharply higher than Q3. We continue to drill more high-grade mineralization uh, at both the Guanasavi mine and the, the Bolanitos mine, and to a certain extent, the El Compass mine. And at our largest growth asset, the Terranera project, we expanded the land position to 20,000 hectares, 45,000 acres, uh, by acquiring two adjacent concessions uh, covering multiple undrilled vein structures. So looking at the charts, right, you can see that our metal production is about 50-50 gold silver, and Guanasvi is, is our largest mine. Let's have a look at the mines. Guanasvi is not only our first and largest mine, it's the only mine where we actually produce uh, uh, Dore silver bars, which we then refine into pure bullion, and that gives us the flexibility to sell or not sell our product uh, on a weekly basis. At Guanasvi, uh, a year and a half ago, uh, a little bit more than that now. Uh, we launched an operational turnaround because the mine had fallen on hard times and caused the company to start losing money in 2017, 2018. Um, uh, the chart here uh, showing the tons of ore to the plant and the grade of the ore to the plant. Uh, you can see Q4 2019, barely a thousand tons per day. And uh, in the, the most recent quarter, it was 1,157 tons per day. So nice increase in, in uh, uh, productivity. And the grades, of course, have sharply increased as well. 312 grams per ton silver equivalents a year ago, rising to 412 grams per ton silver equivalents in the most recent quarter. That meant that production was up 49% year on year, and grades were up 32%, throughput up 15%. So the operational turnaround is now complete and Guanasvi is operating close to capacity. You can see the impact of that operational turnaround on our uh, production of silver equivalents on the chart right. And uh, of course, with rising production uh, comes falling costs. And you can see we've been very successful at driving our cash costs down 
uh, as a result of the operational turnaround. Moving to our second mine of Bolanitos, this was for the better part of a decade our most profitable mine. From 2009 to 2018, we pulled over $200 million of free cash flow out of Bolanitos. Uh, but it, it too fell on hard times in 2018-19, and we launched an operational turnaround there uh, just over a year ago. Uh, you can see that turnaround is now complete as well with uh, rising grades to the plant, rising uh, silver equivalent production, and falling costs. Last but not least, uh, El Compass is our smallest and most rich mine. It's our newest mine. We've only had it now for uh, just under two years. Um, and at El Compass, it's basically a steady state operation, chugging along at close to the plant capacity of 250 tons per day. Year on year production was up 9%, throughput was up 3%, golden uh, grades and recoveries were up, silver grades and, and recoveries were down a bit. And the current resource supports mining until mid year this year, and we made some new discoveries last year, which we're currently assessing for potential inclusion into our mine plan. Um, because it's a gold rich, uh, asset, uh, the uh, cash costs per quarter are very lumpy because of the uh, uh, deduction of the gold credit. But nonetheless, it's generating free cash flow and doing what it's supposed to do. So those are the three operating lines. Why don't we turn our attention now to the growth pipeline of development projects. <clears throat> First up is our Terran Air project in Jalisco State, Mexico. That's located on the west coast of Mexico. Um, and our project is only a, about an hour and a half drive on pavement from the resort city of Puerto Vallarta. Terranera uh, has low, uh, sorry, large and low cost mine potential. And once it's uh, built, uh, it will effectively double our production and half our costs. It is that important to the future of the company. Um, we now control 20,000 hectares, uh, effectively the entire district of San Sebastian. We've now mapped and sampled over 50 old mines, 50 old veins, and uh, we're currently drilling after a two year break uh, on multiple new untested targets. Last year, we delivered a final pre-feasibility study with uh, extremely robust economics and a full feasibility study got underway last September, due in July of this year. So what does Terranera look like? It looks like a 3 million ounce silver, 33,000 ounce per, uh, uh, per year gold. Uh, future producer, that 6 million ounce uh, silver equivalent production for a minimum 10 to 12 years. Uh, that's based on our current reserves and resources totaling 80 million ounces and still growing. And uh, on uh, two main discoveries, the Terranera vein is the bulk of our reserves. It's a thick, rich, deep, uh, vein system that's still untested at depth and a long strike. And the super high grade La Luz, much smaller but much higher grade La Luz discovery on the same property. The two properties we acquired recently, Las Cuatas and Cerro Gordo, are portrayed in the green. So let's look at the economics at Terranera. <clears throat> Uh, based on uh, uh, much lower prices than today, $16 silver and $1,400 gold, uh, we generated a net present value after tax of $137 million last year at a 30% after tax rate of return with a 2.7 year payback. Uh, what's really special about this project is the, are the costs. If you look at the production of silver net of the gold credit and the gold silver mix here is about two thirds silver, one third gold. Uh, uh, our pre-feasibility study forecasts that the cash cost to produce the silver are zero. In other words, the gold pays for everything that the silver is effectively free. Even on an all-in sustaining cost basis, which includes life of mine operating costs, life of mine capital costs, life of mine exploration costs, um, general and administrative costs, and uh, life of mine royalties and taxes, <coughs> even on that basis, We'll generate silver at a measly two bucks an ounce. At... So here we compare the uh, the pre-feasibility study base case, the spot case, and current price cases. And you can see that at current prices, the financial metrics multiply. The NPV grows from 137 million to 350 million. Uh, the IRR grows from 30% to 65%. The payback period shrinks from 2.7 years to barely one year. And the 
annual after tax free cash flow once in production is in the $56 million range. Um, so this will be a literal cash cow once it's up and running. Uh, we are fully permitted at Terranera to commence construction and upon completion of the feasibility study and assuming it's still positive, uh, then we hope to make a production decision in the third quarter and start breaking ground on this exciting new project. The chart here on the uh, uh, slide uh, shows the production and grade profiles, uh, silver production and the silver bars, gold production and gold bars, and the red dots are the silver equivalent grades. Even at the end of the mine life, the 345 gram per ton grades are significantly higher than the entire uh, silver sector. And there's still lots of side opportunities through our feasibility study. We've already expanded the property size by acquiring new concessions. Uh, drilling got underway after a two year break to test new uh, untested veins and expand the resources. The feasibility study will look at uh, evaluating uh, larger plant capacity. Uh, we're looking at more geotech analysis to use cheaper long hole mining. <coughs> we're evaluating truck haulage and ventilation requirements and looking at electric equipment instead of diesel to reduce the carbon footprint. Um, we're still working on metallurgy uh, to tweak that. And we're comparing uh, belt conveyors to take the tailings to the tailings storage site versus haul trucks. Uh, power uh, supply, we're looking at a combination of natural gas and, and solar. So a lot of ways to improve the uh, operational and financial performance even further. Next steps this year, we're completing an EPCM process to appoint a contractor to build the mine. We're building out our own project team. Where, as I said, the exploration drilling is underway. We've already extended some key government permits. Uh, we've ordered some long lead items. We've already taken possession of the large ball mill that's sitting in a warehouse in Puerto Vallarta. And with the feasibility study delivered uh, mid-year, we will then go to the board for approval and between now and then, we hope to secure our debt financing. I'm only going to touch briefly on Peral. It's the second discovery that's sitting in our pipeline. Peral is in southern Chihuahua. It's another famous historic silver district. There's 40 million ounces of silver resources already drilled out from four different historic mines, Veda, Colorado, San Patricio, Palmilla, and Cometa. And we just resumed drilling here after a one year break last year with a $2 million budget, we're trying to grow the resources to 60 million ounces or higher. Last but not least, <clears throat> we hold a portfolio of very exciting uh, large scale uh, gold silver opportunities in Chile. In fact, you can see from the photos portrayed here, just how large these systems are. Uh, the upper photo is our Cerro Marquez porphyry copper gold target. Uh, with a little red pickup truck in the middle of the photo. And uh, that alteration zone spans six by eight kilometers. That's four by uh, six miles. Uh, spectacular large system. Uh, because it's dominantly copper, we're looking now for a copper partner to carry this project forward. Um, the uh, uh, Polo, sorry, that's the Paloma project in the upper with the red truck. The Cerro Marquez is the one in the lower left with the horse. Paloma is the one we're drilling right now. And it's a multi-million uh, ounce gold silver open pit target in northernmost Chile. And um, so far we're getting some very interesting results. We should have uh, our first release on this in February. And last but not least in the, in the bottom right corner, you can see, uh, sorry, upper right corner, you can see an alpaca. That's from our um, AIDA uh, silver project. It's up in the corner with Bolivia. And it's an extension of the Bolivian silver belt. So three world-class exploration targets uh, to be drilled in Chile. Uh, bulk tonnage porphyry copper at Cerro Marquez, a high sulfidation epithermal gold at Paloma, and a low sulfidation epithermal silver project at Aida. So all of this adds up to um, some of the best leverage to growth in the sector. And our operating mines give you leverage to growing cash flow, not just because of rising metal prices, but because of falling costs. Our development portfolio is best in sector, and Terra Nera will single-handedly double our production and half our costs. And last but not least, 
through the th portfolio of three world-class targets in Chile, uh, we have leverage to a world-class discovery. So there's 157 million shares out, currently trading at four and a half dollars, and that gives you a market cap between 700 and 750 million US. Very strong daily volume, five million shares a day. We're listed on the big board in New York, EXK. And again, a strong working capital and cash position, no long-term debt. One large shareholder, the Van Eck GDXJ fund, owns about 5% of the company. And one strategic shareholder, the world's largest silver mining company, Fresneo PLC, has a 2% toehold in Endeavor. 10 analysts cover the stock. And uh, again, we have a sector leading beta of, uh, that is the leverage of our share price to the silver price. So catalyst drive value uh, in 2021. Well, obviously we'd love to continue uh, squeezing our operating costs by improving uh, productivity incrementally at each of the three mines. Uh, we're looking at uh, continuing to optimize Terra Nera through the publication of a full feasibility study in July, after which we hope to make a production decision and break ground on that mine, all the permits being in place. Uh, we continue to extend mine lives by replacing reserves and growing resources at the three mines. And we're currently drilling this world-class Paloma uh, gold silver prospect in Chile to make a new discovery. Uh, last but not least, even though we haven't announced any new acquisitions, uh, we are always looking and are hopeful that in 2021, we can land yet another core asset. So why invest in Endeavor Silver? Well, what you get with Endeavor is a mid-tier silver producer who simply through the development of its own organic uh, development projects uh, will become the next senior producer of silver uh, in the sector. We're led by an experienced management team we have a strong balance sheet with no long-term debt, and we are a pure silver gold player. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brad. Great, great presentation, very concise. We're going to start with uh, our friend Jeff Masseri. Um, Jeff, do you have questions today for uh, Brad? Hi, Brad. Um, really great presentation, and you just go from strength to strength. It's fantastic. Um, Thank you, Jeff. And I, I would just like to raise the question, uh, which was raised by Marion Catusa a while ago, about uh, Mexico and Chile both being non-swap um, countries with the U.S. And um, I was wondering how the um, the permitting background will go for Chile um, at this time, and. Uh, how things are going in Mexico, whether they will increase the taxes or what, what you know, what, what is your political uh, reaction? Well, let's go first because that's where uh, we're most exposed. And uh, we're very fortunate in that our three operating mines are in uh, very safe areas up in the central part of the country, uh, north central part. And uh, so we've, we've not had any uh, community issues, union issues, uh, narco issues. Uh, so we're very fortunate for that, thankfully. Um, and also our development pipeline, uh, the Terranera and Peral projects are in, in basically in areas that are uh, very comfortable to work. Uh, as a result, our permitting has been generally uh, very quick in the north. It was a little bit slower at Terranera, uh, only because in the state of Jalisco, there was at the time only one operating mine. And so the, uh, the state authorities didn't really have much knowledge or experience granting mining permits, but we got them through the process and the permits have been granted. Uh, the Outlook Mexico, um, you know, there's always the risk that with a uh, socialist government, there'll, uh, there'll be attempts to raise taxes, but uh, mining's paying, uh, it's amongst the highest uh, tax sector in all of Mexico. I mean, uh, if you combine the 30% profit tax with the 17% uh, sales tax, and then you layer on, not only all the, uh, the employee taxes, but the 7.5% uh, tax on, on earnings before interest and taxes. And that, that, that's a very uh, significant hit. We, our tax load in Mexico is comparable to Canada or Chile, 50% or more. Mm -hmm. So I don't see it rising. And um, that risk, while uh, we have to accept that there is some risk, I think it's low. Uh, Chile, uh, we've actually been very fast on permitting the exploration because we're in the far north. It's the high Atacama Desert, nothing grows there. Um, we are, we have actually found some, some uh, water reservoirs, uh, that is groundwater. 
And um, because the types of projects we're looking for, these are, uh, are not, um, so, uh, at least the gold and silver projects, they're not massive water consumers or, or electricity consumers compared to the, the massive porphyry copper projects. And our, our porphyry copper is actually uh, not in the High Atacama, it's down closer to the coast where there's a fully built out infrastructure. So uh, from a, uh, a going forward point of view in Chile, permitting's not been a problem. We don't anticipate it'll be a problem. Uh, we do anticipate though, that we're gonna have to find our own water at, at source. Uh, fortunately, uh, proximal to both Paloma and Aida, uh, there's a natural gas pipeline going across to, to Argentina. So uh, we do think that natural gas would be the power of choice uh, if we're successful. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you very, very much. One last question quickly is, uh, how much did you say the cash position was? Uh, cash at the end of Q3 was in the $54 million range and it will be substantially higher at year end. Okay, that's terrific. Thank you ever so much. Thanks. Thanks for your questions as always, Jeff. Uh, we're going to turn to Bruce Daigle. Bruce, do you have a question today for Brad? No, at this time, uh, I'm, this is a new idea for me and it was a great presentation. So no questions at this moment. Thank you. Thanks for being on the call, Bruce. Pleasure yeah. to have you. Well, we're going to turn to our friend, Chris Marcus. Chris? We're just getting Chris unmuted. Hmm. Can you hear us, Chris? If you're having trouble with audio, I do know that Chris uh, sent in his sent in a question as well. So I'll read that while we see if he can connect. Chris says, "I'd love to see about how the leverage on Endeavor cash flows look if we get a silver price in the 30 to 50 range." <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, well, so we're going to produce over three million ounces of silver this year, and. Um, our cost to produce the silver um, cash costs will be in the, uh, we haven't released our guidance yet, but let's say sub $10. Um, then uh, the leverage going from 25 to $50 times three uh, is an additional $75 million of, of uh, cash flow. So it's, it's a massive impact. Thank you. And Chris, did you manage to come online? Is that correct? Yeah, I did. Are, are you able to hear me all right? We are now. Uh, did I do faithful on your question? Yeah, I appreciate that and certainly good news, Brad. And just one other question, if I may. You mentioned that you're looking at acquisition targets this year and love to hear anything more about what what's the profile of what you'd be targeting there. Well, of course, I can't speak to any particular opportunities, but in general, our m and strategy is driven by location. Uh, obviously, we're gonna stick to the Americas and we prefer Canada, U.S., Mexico, uh, Chile, uh, maybe Panama, maybe Colombia. Uh, so fairly picky about location. Uh, we're going to stick to our commodity mix, so silver plus anything. And, um, you know, uh, we, we stick to things where we can add value. So we typically avoid, you know, fully uh, unfolded assets that, where we can't make much of a difference. We typically like to buy things at a little bit earlier stage where we can either uh, make a discovery or um, uh, take from through the development phase to production, that kind of thing. Thanks, Brad. Appreciate that. Thanks for your question. Thanks for your questions, Chris. Always a pleasure having you on the call. Uh, we're going to turn to Michael Potter. Michael, questions today? Good to have you on with us, Michael. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thanks for a great talk, Brad. Um, if you get the um, go ahead to start the construction of um, of um, Terranera in the middle of this year, how long do you think you will get? It will take you to get to the um, to get to um, full commercial production. 
So we have an initial 18 month construction timeline and 24 months, including uh, full commissioning. So if we break ground in Q3 of 2021, we'll look for commercial production in Q3 of 2023. Okay, and one other question. What, did, what decided you to go to Chile um, and start looking at something which looks like open, big open pit pro um, projects when your sort of base seems to be underground high grade veins? Very good question. Uh, and we get asked that a lot. Um, but very simply, we were very successful at a very specific business model, uh, finding and developing uh, what is fairly small but high grade vein systems in Mexico. And there is a limit to the growth of the company living off of that business model. So to crack open our future, we felt that it was important during the bear market to go looking for something bigger. And the biggest uh, historic silver belt in the world uh, with the biggest historic mines is actually Bolivia. Uh, Mexico is number two, but uh, Bolivia had, uh, has prolific history, including some uh, spectacular large mines, Potosí, Cerro Rico. Um, so we actually started there and traced the Bolivian silver belt south into Chile and Argentina. And in Argentina, there's actually two operating mines, Chinchillas and Perquitas. Uh, there's roads, there's villages, it's fully built and uh, readily accessible. And if you simply cross the border into Chile, there's no roads, no villages, and no mines. So that was our, that was our initial premise. And Aida was our first property. We acquired it th largely through staking of a uh, uh, highly anomalous uh, system uh, identified from satellite imagery. Uh, we then found that there was actually some small historic mines owned by a couple of brothers, and we optioned those too. And um, we're still in the permitting phase at AIDA, but we feel it's a multi hundred million ounce silver target. It's an eight by three kilometer alteration zone. So we, we love uh, that part of Chile, and that led us then to Paloma, which is only uh, 30 minutes away, and that led us to Cerro Marquez. Uh, so that's how it happened. Oh, great. And which one of those projects is it you're drilling at the moment? We're drilling Paloma. It's about 250 kilometers north of Solaris Norte in the high uh, Altiplano. Uh, and uh, it's a young system. Uh, so it's uh, Miocene in age. And, um, you know, it's been unroofed, but uh, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're seeing a very, very large target there. Um, the drillable, the first drillable target is a kilometer by a kilometer and a half defined by um, geology, geochemistry, geophysics, uh, clay studies, age dating. And uh, we're, we're just getting our teeth into that target now. Okay, great. Thanks very much. That's all I've got for the moment. Thanks for your questions. turn to our friend Paul Forsyth. Paul, do you have a question today? I'm trying to get Paul unmuted. Okay, well, let's turn to Rolf Wagner. Let's go to Rolf and then we can come back to Paul. Rolf, can you hear us? Are you there? Some of these muting is difficult. Rolf, do you have a question for us today? Actually, we've got Paul on, so we'll come back to Rolf. Paul, you're there with us? Yes, I'm, I'm just uh, new to the stock. I just own a small position right now. Um, like the way it works around space. Um, and um, I really don't have much. I just wanted to learn more about what you guys are all about. Uh, I have some other questions I'm sure I'll work, I'm working on, but. Um, I, it's, it's a great story. I, I like it a lot. So thank you for the presentation. It's very well done. Great. Well, thanks, thanks Paul. <laughs> yep. we'll vote of confidence there, Brad. Paul, we'll be back in touch for our next production. Um, Rolf, are you there with us now? Okay. Um, Doug Wow. Doug, are you unmuted? Can you ask a question? Here's Doug. Sure. Been following Brad a long time. I love this bunch of projects. 
Um, of course, Ms. Sari went, my partner went and asked all my favorite questions about the permitting. You said you had all the permits you need for the mines in Mexico, is that correct? Uh, for Terra Nera, correct. Okay, and when you're dealing with this gold and silver, are we talking about deray bars and concentrate or what's happening there? Good question. So um, I mentioned at the start of the presentation that Guanasfi is the only mine where we produce bars. Uh, Bolanitos and Compass produce uh, gold silver concentrates and both uh, Terra Nera and Peral will be concentrates as well. And we typically sell our cons to two or three different concentrate buyers, they're metal trading companies, and uh, they would typically blend our high grade concentrates into uh, lower grade concentrates to, to upgrade the combined cons to a higher payable level. So they make a little bit of money on our cons by blending them. They, they make a little, but it looks like you're making a lot. I mean, we make a lot. If, if, my, if my math is correct, you're like 30 or 40 cents a share of cash money, <laughs> which is... Uh, we're sitting on some nice cash and growing quickly. That is wonderful, Brad. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Um, appreciate your, your comments as well as your questions. We're going to now turn back to, uh, to you, uh, Brad, for closing remarks. We've covered all the questions. Well, thanks again, David, for this opportunity to speak. Um, you know, 2021 uh, is looking um, very attractive from our point of view. We're uh, catching a tailwind with metal prices, even though they're in a consolidation mode at this time. I do think you're going to see a retest of last year's highs uh, during the year, uh, possibly even new highs. Um, we have uh, obviously our minds sorted out. They were giving us some headaches in, in prior years and now they're, they're humming along, generating free cash flow. Um, so that leverage to free cash flow uh, that I mentioned earlier is, is uh, obviously one of the key catalysts for uh, growing our cash position and, and a reason to own the stock. Uh, and then perhaps the best reason, um, you know, if you look around the silver sector, uh, there are, very few producing companies uh, who do what we do, which is uh, invest every year in grassroots exploration to make new discoveries. Lots of companies do brownfields exploration to expand resources around existing mines, and we do that too. Uh, but few, few solar companies uh, step out and go looking for something new, like Terra Nera, like Peral, like Chile. And because the entire history of the company is based on the success of our exploration team. Every ore body we've developed, every mine we've built, was on the basis of uh, discoveries of our exploration group. Obviously, uh, we feel that's the key driver going forward. So thanks again, everybody, for listening, and let's have some fun and make some money this year. Thank you, Brad, for presenting. Great job, you and you, uh, you told the stories um, in a way that even our generalists could understand. So very well done. I'll be following up with everyone. We'll be following up with everyone. And we greatly appreciate your attendance this afternoon. And of course, always the Q&A, the questions from our, from our attendees is always critical. I want to wish everyone a very pleasant afternoon. Thanks again.